the message and then I'll stop. Okay, uh, I wanna thank you for uh, participating in today's LHA uh, session. Um, the price of denial epidemics in Northwest Arkansas. Louisiana. Uh, we, ha we have three presenters. Um, first will be Laura McLemore, who will be presenting a paper, The De Death and the Price of Lemons, The Great Influenza of 1918 in Caddo Parish. Laura is the William B. Weiner Jr. Professor of Archives and Historic Preservation and Director of the North, Northwest Louisiana Archives at Louisiana State University of Shreveport. She's been a, she is a certified archivist and has a PhD in history from the University of North Texas. She has numerous presentations and publications, including serving as editor of the Battle of New Orleans in History and Memory. Our second presenter will be Sarah Hamer, who has amassed a master career as an independent writer and editor. She has taught creative writing and screenwriting through the Department of Continuing Education at Louisiana State University, Shreveport, and is a candidate for a master's degree in history at LSUS this coming May. Our final presentation uh, will be by Dr. David Hyland, who is the director of the Betty and Leonard Phillips Deaf Action Center in Shreveport. His presentation is entitled The Making of, a Small, of Small Town Rage, the work and influence of ACT UP Shreveport in the fight against HIV in the 1980s. David has a master's degree in deaf education from Lamar University and a doctorate in leadership studies from LSU Shreveport. Professionally, he has been stuck in a rut, having served as executive director of the Deaf Action Center in Shreveport for the past 45 years. So, He's, he's, he's venturing into new ground now. Okay, um, I am Brady Banta. Uh, I am retired and living in Jonesboro, Arkansas, and I will be the kind of the, uh, the moderator and commentator of the sessions. Um, we, will prevent, we will present the, um, the papers, presentations in the order uh, listed. Uh, if you have comments, questions, please post them on the chat board and we will deal with them um, after I have made my brief comments at the end of the papers and then we'll turn it into a discussion of people's uh, questions and comments. So if there are no other uh, things we need to cover, which I can't remember that they are at this point, uh, Laura, we'll turn it over to you for your presentation. All right. Thank you, Brady. On Christmas Eve 1917, front page of the Shreveport Journal announced a settlement of the oil worker strike, credited Bibles and playing cards for stopping bullets and saving lives on the battlefield, and reassured readers that Santa Claus, though having joined the Allies, would remember all the kiddies just the same. On page two was a brief item titled, Two Men from North Louisiana Die in France, one of influenza pneumonia, the other no cause given. Six weeks later, the headline in the Shreveport Times of February 3rd, 1918 read, Real Dogs of War. Buried on page 10, a brief item reported the death of two soldiers at Camp Beauregard near Alexandria. One, a 24-year-old from influenza, and the other, a 23-year-old from pneumonia. Articles in local newspapers throughout the spring of 1918 carried generic articles on public health, describing symptoms and known origins of diseases in moist climates, loosely categorized as chronic catarrh. Dr. G.C. Chandler, head of the Shreveport Board of Health, touted the progress the city had made in reducing diseases of all kinds. Despite sporadic, sporadic reports from Europe and other parts of the United States, Chandler's reassurance led the Times to announce in July 1918 
The report current here yesterday that several cases of Spanish influenza had appeared in Shreveport seems to have been without foundation. Dr. Chandler said last night no reports on Spanish influenza in the city had reached his office. There were, in fact, half a dozen confirmed deaths from influenza or pneumonia following influenza in Caddo Parish from January through July 1918, which suggests that there were probably a number of unreported cases. Meanwhile, in Boston, where hundreds of men awaited permanent assignments for the Great War, public health authorities noted a sudden and very significant increase in cases of pneumonia at Camp Devens during the third week of August. They suspected that an influenza epidemic might have started among soldiers there. They assumed these cases were random examples of the epidemic that had attacked many army camps during the spring of 1918. Then suddenly the influenza exploded. By September 22nd, 20% of the entire camp was sick, about 9,000 men. The pneumonias and deaths had begun. And as Dr. Roy Grist, one of the Army physicians, wrote to a colleague, this was no ordinary pneumonia. The sickness attacked the young and healthy, and nothing could stop its progress. Their faces turned a dark brownish purple. They coughed up blood. Their feet turned black. As the end neared, they frantically gasped for breath. A blood-tinged saliva bubbled out of their mouths. They died, drowning as their lungs filled with a reddish fluid. While Army physicians struggled with this deadly disease outbreak, the attention of civilians in Boston, Shreveport, and across America the first week in September 1918 focused on patriotic parades and Labor Day events. Demonstration honoring labor attracts many, proclaimed the Shreveport Journal on September 2, 1918. As reports of influenza outbreaks in other parts of the country became increasingly common, Public officials in Caddo Parish finally began issuing advice and mild warnings about avoiding the flu. On September 18, 1918, the journal announced free ventilation, foe of Spanish influenza. Dr. Chandler now openly admitted that Spanish flu had undeniably arrived and issued advice on preventing its spread. On September 21st, the Alexandria Town Talk reported that La Grippe had been officially listed as an infectious disease. All cases of influenza or La Grippe were to be promptly reported to the State Board of Health and to local health authorities. Specimens would be examined free of charge in State Board of Health laboratories in New Orleans, Charity Hospital in Shreveport, and St. Francis Sanitarium, Monroe. Louisianans, especially outside the New Orleans metropolitan area, could perhaps be forgiven for ignoring the earliest signs of warnings about influenza. Seasonal bouts of flu, pneumonia, measles, and other infectious diseases were common. Death was a regular visitor. Epidemics of cholera, smallpox, and yellow fever were lived history for many. Further, the United States was engaged in a world war that dominated the headlines of every newspaper. Readers were constantly begged, cajoled, and threatened to buy Liberty Bonds and donate to war funds. President Woodrow Wilson never spoke of influenza or publicly acknowledged the pandemic. The Caddo oil fields were booming, swelling the population of Shreveport and generating wealth. Advice in newspapers, like the article on chronic catarrh, made many respiratory symptoms seem routine and unavoidable. There is no disease condition in moist climates so common as this, Dr. Andrew Currier wrote. Moreover, the symptoms he described as chronic nasal catarrh or chronic rhinitis were those associated with flu, insomnia, dizziness, dullness, headaches, poor memory, impairment of smell, sight, and hearing, and constant discomfort in the throat and larynx. But the influenza germ that made its way into North Louisiana communities was no ordinary flu, and the cost of ignoring warnings or denying that fact would prove to be high. By October 1918, the effects of Spanish flu were becoming pronounced in Shreveport. 910 cases were reported in the newspaper, but that number was corrected by Dr. Chandler the following day. The actual number, he said, was 14, and 10 of those were nurses. He had advised citizens to protect themselves by avoiding the disease, 
The number of cases in Shreveport would soon be reduced to a minimum, he assured them. Although the presence of Spanish influenza was recognized and measures such as social distancing at public gatherings, the closings of schools, churches, and theaters, and the canceling of public events were taken to reduce the spread, messaging from local authorities continued to be confusing. F.C. Bennett, Chandler's counterpart in Monroe, stated that the disease was ordinary la grippe in a severe form and that the quarantine was now useless since the disease had assumed epidemic proportions. Advising advertising further complicated the public's understanding of the threat from influenza. All kinds of folk cures and fraudulent remedies were promoted and tried by people who never saw a nurse or doctor. Everything from hanging camphor or garlic around their necks to gargling with disinfectant. Advertising often masqueraded as legitimate journalism. Ads were very difficult to distinguish from news. Common to all of them were confident claims that there was a way to prevent or stop the influenza and to survive. Some even affected financial markets. One such article in the Times of October 9, 1918 proclaimed, Lemons and Onions, Foes of Influenza. The lemon treatment was so popular in some places that local governments had to step in to squelch the lemon speculators who were hoarding lemons to drive up the price. This same article claimed that Boston instituted the lemon cure when the epidemic hit and the lemon treatment quickly spread to other localities causing a lemon shortage in America. By late October, the Times announced 60 new cases of flu in city, three deaths occur, price of lemons takes a big jump. A Texas Street grocer told a reporter, when this influenza epidemic started, we were buying lemons at $3.50 per box, and within a week, the price went up to $13.50, which is almost prohibitive. All the sick people wanted lemons, and many of the poorer people are not getting them now, on account of the price. A headline read, Many Free Cures for Flu Sprung on Health Authorities. One of these urged readers to place an onion at the bedpost, draw out the fever of Spanish influenza, point the index finger of the left hand at the moon and make a wish, then go to work as usual next day. An article in the Town Talk provided an excellent example of an advertisement masquerading as news. After a few authoritative paragraphs came the punchline, you can prevent the disease by killing the germs before they spread throughout your body. Go to the nearest drugstore and get one of the famous Hyomi inhaling outfits. Some highly touted treatments were actually dangerous, such as calotabs, a mild laxative also used as a treatment for syphilis. Mercurous chloride, a main ingredient, was a common source of mercury poisonings. In January 1919, it was reported that Dr. C.M. Abbott from the State Board of Health went through city school in Monroe, spraying noses and throats of students with diachloramine solution, which he said had proven one of the most satisfactory preventatives. This appears to be a reference to dichloramine, a disinfectant used to drink, treat drinking water. Dichloropetoluene sulfonamide was a chemical used as a disinfectant in the early 20th century. Toluene is an aromatic carbon, toxic to humans, its use today is monitored and limited by OSHA. Citizens in North Louisiana were also seduced by premature reassurances that the disease would soon pass. October 1918 had seen a spike in influenza and related pneumonia cases and deaths uh, in Caddo Parish, but by the end of the month, local officials felt optimistic. On October 22nd, Dr. Chandler wired his daily report to the State Board of Health acknowledging three deaths and 60 new cases that day. This, he told the Times, is a fine showing and indicates that the epidemic is on the decline. He was cheered by the outlook. His cheerfulness, however, was a bit premature. At a time when so little was known about this novel flu virus, the future was really unpredictable. The universal desire to believe the end of the epidemic was near, however, denied that reality. Flu masks go on whatnot shelf. Epidemic ban will be raised in city and state with last midnight stroke, announced the Times of November 15, 1918. A month later, the Alexandria Weekly Town Talk announced considerable increase in flu. 
The Times of January 27, 1919, described the efforts of the Cooperative Travelers' Aid of Shreveport on duty at Union Station. The amount of illness and even poverty needing aid was deplorable, the matrons reported. Politics was involved, of course. The Shreveport Journal, July 17, 1919, announced, Chandler declares he has been shorn of all his power. Dr. Chandler told a journal reporter he was no longer city health officer except in name, that recent actions of the Board of Health had stripped him of all his power to maintain ideal sanitary conditions. Yet in August, according to the state's top health officer, the consensus among prominent physicians in the country indicated that a recurrence was imminent. In fact, Spanish flu came to North Louisiana in three waves. The first in early spring 1918 appeared in a mild form easily mistaken for the usual seasonal illness. It reappeared in its most deadly variant in August 1918. It subsided everywhere in late spring or summer of 1919, but returned in January and February 1920, giving that year the highest death rate nationwide of the 20th century, except for the two preceding years. One estimate puts the number of deaths in Caddo Parish at less than 500. Overall in Louisiana, about 245,000 cases were reported. There were about 5,500 deaths. Like national and worldwide statistics on the number of cases and deaths from Spanish flu, these are little more than an estimate. They underscore a major obstacle to understanding the experience, meaning, and lasting effects on society of the influenza epidemic of 1918-1920. As historian Alfred W. Crosby explained, the magnitude of the pandemic in itself helped to distort its recording. Doctors and nurses were too busy with patients to write reports. The president of Louisiana's Board of Health complained in fall 1918 that only 20% of New Orleans physicians and only 14% of the state's physicians outside of that city were reporting flu cases. The reporting situation in Louisiana was so egregious that an exasperated Oscar Dowling, the state's top health official, published a threat in the newspapers, report all cases or face courts. He sent out telegrams to mayors and health officers asking for the immediate prosecution of all physicians failing to report promptly every case of influenza they knew about. Penalties ranged from $10 to $200 for the first offense, $25 to $400 for the second offense, $50 to $500, and $6 to 12 months imprisonment for, or both for each subsequent violation. It didn't help much. So many who sickened never saw a doctor or nurse. The lack of complete and accurate records makes researching the impact of the 1918 pandemic on most locations outside of New Orleans difficult. Admission records of Shreveport Charity Hospital end on July 1, 1917 and resume April 7, 1920. The earliest entry in the influenza book maintained by the hospital was made on October 29, 1918 and the last on March 30, 1919. Of the 631 entries, only five deaths were recorded. There were 312 burials in Caddo Parish listed in find -a grave for 1918. Of those, 203 were age 45 or under. And 55 of those 203 were identified as having died of influenza pneumonia. 39 died of other causes. The rest lacked any specified cause of death. While the actual number of cases is impossible to determine, the number of deaths is nearly as difficult. Louisiana death records available through Ancestry do not display cause of death. Even assuming everyone who died of flu and flu-related pneumonia in Caddo Parish was recorded in Find a Grave, not all have obituaries identifying cause of death. This is especially true of the black community as there are no extant local black newspapers from that period. Overshadowed by World War I and obscured by spotty record-keeping, the Spanish flu pandemic faded in the collective memory. With the 21st century world reeling from the shock of its own pandemic, the Spanish flu has finally captured public interest. Unfortunately, the questions may be many, but the answers, especially on a local level, are few. It was the worst flu pandemic in recorded history, and it was likely exacerbated by a combination of censorship, skepticism, and denial among warring nations, wrote author Becky Little. In her exploration of the social and cultural history of it, Laura Spinney noted 
The Spanish flu infected one in three people on Earth, or 500 million human beings. Between the first case re recorded on March 4, 1918, and the last sometime in March 1920, it killed 50 to 100 million people, a range that reflects the uncertainty that still surrounds it. The cost of that uncertainty, whether from censorship, skepticism, or denial, was tragically high, as evidenced in the early newspaper reports in Caddo Parish in October 1918. In an effort to reassure people and avoid panic, or from lack of information themselves, health officials downplayed the severity of the situation. Caddo Parish was doing so well, they said. Everybody was recovering just fine, they said like poor Leon R. Smith, state senator and son-in-law, former Governor Newton C. Blanchard, who was reportedly doing well until he died at age 43. The cost of the great influenza of 1918 in North Louisiana can be measured in the loss of lives, livelihoods, and a generation of talent and leadership. A lot has changed since 1918. Science has advanced dramatically. Much more is known about the origins and spread of H1N1 and infectious disease generally. Isolation of the COVID-19 virus occurred much more quickly in 2020, and vaccines were developed with unprecedented speed. It was 1928 before the Spanish flu virus strain was isolated, and 1946 before a vaccine became available for the civilian population. Medical facilities, technology, and equipment have radically improved. What has not changed significantly is human behavior. Much of the rhetoric, politics, profiteering, and denial is as evident today as it was in 1918. The United States has reached or exceeded 31 million cases of COVID-19 and 556,000 deaths in the 14 months since the Centers for Disease Control began tracking the virus in January 2020. Caddo Parish has recorded about 25,000 cases and over 720 deaths. The state of Louisiana, about 450,000 cases with over 10,000 deaths. The influenza pandemic, first identified in the United States in early 1918, remained through early 1920. The United States Department of Health and Human Services estimated about 28% of the population of 105 million were infected 675,000 deaths were recorded. If the current pandemic is of comparable duration, with more than a year to go, the price we pay as a society may be even higher. You're, you're, uh, you're muted. Laura, can you hear me? I can hear you, but um, okay. Brady's muted. Brady, you're muted. I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Now. Okay. Um, as I was saying uh, to myself, <laughs> apparently, um, our next presenter is Sarah Hamer. Her presentation is "The Road Not Taken: Doc Dr. Willis Butler and the Shreveport Narcotic Clinic." 1919-1925. And again, before Sarah starts, if you have questions or comments, uh, please post them on the chat board. Okay, Sarah, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. I apologize in advance. I'm hoping that my uh, internet is going to work well enough. And if it doesn't, then we'll make other arrangements. So fingers crossed. Can you hear me now? Yes, you, I, okay, can, I right, can hear great. you fine, yeah. Okay, great, all right. Well, drug addiction is nothing new. Efforts to control drug addiction aren't new either. However, an experimental clinic in Shreveport, Louisiana, run by a committed and determined doctor between 1919 and 1925, produced results unheard of in its own time period and may serve as a cautionary tale as we careen toward another time of widespread acceptance. Dr. Willis P. Butler opened and operated a narcotic clinic in Shreveport in opposition to cultural morals, community disapproval, and ultimately in direct violation of federal regulations. Dan Waldorf states that Butler's goal was twofold, to find a cure for addiction and to help people with incurable diseases find pain relief. 
The Shreveport Narcotic Clinic served at least 1,500 patients in six years and subsequently became the most famous and controversial maintenance and treatment program of its kind in America, if not in the world. As Butler attempted to deal with a growing drug addicted population in Shreveport and surrounding areas. At the time, there had been a clamor for some help in dealing with the drug program across the United States. Narcotic clinics were opened in many areas, including New Orleans and New York City, but many of these clinics were simply clearing houses for drug addicts to receive a daily fix and were vilified due to corruption and illegal activities. After a time, the federal government stepped in, closing the clinics and arresting doctors, druggists, and addicts. However, <laughs> Butler came out of the fray with his reputation intact. Indeed, he was praised by local politicians and newspapers for the efficient and discriminating manner in which his clinic was run, according to Joe Spillane, who interviewed 90-year-old Dr. Butler in the 1970s. Butler was assured of local support and temporarily frustrated the designs of interloping federal agents, allowing him to continue his grand experiment far longer than other clinics. As the war to end all wars ended in late 1918, there was a vibrant new age of invention and technology. But this bright time had a dark side. Rampant drug abuse of all sorts flourished in the late 19th and early 20th century in the United States. Painkillers, considered a medical miracle at a time when there were few options, were easily accessible and relatively inexpensive providing multiple opportunities to men and women of all class levels and cultures. Even wealthy and prominent women were vulnerable before antibiotics and the event of modern medicine with doctors injecting women with morphine to numb the pain of female tr troubles or to turn the willful hysteric into a manageable invalid. Until the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914 which regulated the sale, taxation, and use of drugs, laudanum, a mixture of opium and alcohol, was regularly delivered to many expensive houses owned by the elite of the city. Pain of any sort was easily dealt with. The often accompanying addiction was much harder to face. Black America in post-Civil War America did not fail, fare much better. Cohen proposes that cocaine use among blacks was an underlying cause of the Jim Crow laws. When the Harrison Act was being considered in 1913, Southern lawmakers dusted off horror stories of black rape and riot and the social menace presented by cocaine. Injuries from armed conflicts often cause chronic pain with veterans becoming addicted during treatment for injuries received in the line of duty. Latimer and Goldberg state that one 82-year-old Civil War veteran who had 55 years of regular intravenous morphine use behind him was quite upset because suddenly he was subject to years in a federal jail if the police found out he was using opioids, opioids for his pain. Social standing didn't matter. Latimer and Goldberg state that four doctors, two retired judges, a lawyer, a newspaper editor, one of the Shreveport Symphony musicians, a printer, two glassblowers, a local oil refining millionaire, and the architect who had put up most of the striking French colonial edifices of which the city is still patriotically proud, all were patients at Butler's clinic. Although some may have been using drugs for pleasure, many addicts had incurable maladies, such as tuberculosis and venereal disease, and men had been addicted by their doctors who had few resources to deal with pain. In fact, until the Harrison Drug Addict, excuse me, I'm sorry, say it again. In fact, until the Harrison Drug Act of 1914, overprescription of opiates by doctors, whether accidental or with intent, was commonplace since addiction and drugs were little understood. Drug treatment in the United States, no matter what, whether the addict was white or black, male or female, young or old, wealthy or poor, was largely institutional and emphasized total abstinence. Addicts were sent to, were sent to prisons or hospitals and or self-help communal programs. 
and were expected to remain drug free when they left. This atmosphere of addiction was rampant in 1919 when Dr. Willis Butler was asked to open a narcotic clinic in Shreveport by his friend and colleague, Dr. Oscar Dowling, the president of the Louisiana Board of Health. In a letter dated March 12, 1919, Dowling stated, we are having repeated requests from Shreveport that some provision be made for a daily supply of drugs. Butler recognized the value of a narcotic clinic and determined that if he created a clinic in Shreveport, it would be handled much differently. Butler opened his clinic on May 3rd, 1919 in the T.E. Shumpert Memorial Sanitarium and patients poured in. He set up procedures meant to control every aspect of a unified and specific program, including a thorough examination, a signed pledge by the patient, a treatment plan, and a minimum month-long stay for each patient. According to Trevock, Butler's approach was to treat the organic illness first using whatever means he had. To do so, he divided his patients through a type of triage into three classes. First, Butler discovered that the majority of his patients had severe organic problems, with approximately 40% of the patients having signs of venereal disease. He told Dr. Dowling that they should be, and many are, treated for this and were allowed opioids at the level needed until the disease was contained or cured. Then they were switched to the detoxification phase of treatment. Traybach marveled at the really undefinable fine sense of clinical judgment, which much, must have been vital in determining that a patient had truly reached the stage where he could be induced to undergo detoxification at a time when the prognosis for success was good. 30% of his patients went into the second group. I'm sorry, I missed it, there we go. Who were considered incurable. Some who had been bedridden for years, others who were old and decrepit, while many have had numerous operations but can never be restored to health. Butler felt that to force these incurables into addiction treatment or to deprive them of the drug they needed to maintain a minimal lifestyle was to be without any sense of judgment and an absence of all understanding or human sympathy. Diseases that were treated with a simple drug re regime in the 21st century were de debilitating and deadly in 1919. Butler gave these patients end of life care but made no attempt to wean them off of the palliative opiates. The third group of patients, those addicted with no organic disease were immediately put into detoxification. In Sidney Howard's interview in Hearst International Magazine in May of 1923, Butler stated that he issued every man jack of them enough morphine to get and keep a job. They all had to work and make an honest living with inspectors regularly checking up on them or they would be denied treatment. I always tried not to lose sight of the human side of any case, Butler said, adding that he often had to deal very sternly with them, but tried to give the deserving what he considered a fair chance. Butler told Howard he was proud to watch them change. I would see them come into the dispensary filthy outcasts. I would watch them reestablish themselves in their own eyes and before their fellows as thoroughly respectable citizens. When asked, have you been helped by Butler's methods? One man who had been addicted for 18 years said, that he had always had this rheumatism, putting him back on dope again every time after every cure. After seven or eight years of dragging my family around from place to place, the man came to Butler's clinic and his story changed. Now I work hard until nine o'clock at night, take care of my family and save all the money I can. The man continued by telling how if the clinic closed and he couldn't get his treatment, he was afraid that he would have to jump up at any time and leave my business and all and find somewhere else where I can get regular doses. At the time of the article, he was incarcerated in a Memphis jail. And this was not the only sad story by any means. Starting almost as soon as he opened his clinic, Butler was besieged by various federal agencies which continually investigated and harassed him and his practices. 
Many attempts to frame Butler for corruption and malfeasance failed miserably as he fought to do the work he thought so important. In fact, the clinic had regular in-depth inspections from federal agents between 1919 and 1921, and Butler's successes were many. He was praised when on April 2nd, 1920, the Shreveport Times stated that the federal agents found the Shreveport Institution to be the best they have yet visited, and they have traveled from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from the lakes to the Gulf. Even Dowling, who eventually became an implacable enemy, agreed in a letter to Butler on September 29, 1919, I approve of your treating cases of drug addiction as you have planned. According to Latimer and Goldberg, at first some governmental officials such as the Commissioner of Public Safety in Caddo Parish didn't support Butler's efforts, even stating that all addicts should be driven straight into the river. The commissioner's tune changed, however, when Butler took him out of earshot and told him that his own mother was a patient in the clinic. After that, the commissioner supported and protected Butler in his work, even to providing law enforcement help with addicts who came from other states looking for narcotics. But regardless of Butler's successes, regardless of city, parish, and state governmental backing, regardless of a supportive community, his narcotic clinic was under attack almost immediately after opening in 1919. The problems weren't because of any lack of due diligence on his part, but because of between the 1914 Harrison Act, the Supreme Court rulings of 1919, the 18th Amendment to prohibit alcohol sales ratified on January 16, 1919, and the failures of all the other narcotic clinics Butler's successes didn't matter. Waldorf states that other clinics across the country were not as exemplary and the federal government using the New York clinic as a negative model felt justified in closing every one of them. In March, 1921, when the Louisiana Board of Health under pressure from the Federal Narcotics Division withdrew its support, Butler officially closed the first narcotic clinic, reopening the same day under the direction and support of the Shreveport City Council, who determined that they would assume the position of foster parent to the clinic established by Dr. Butler for the treatment of drug addicts and diseases as reported by the Times on March 30th, 1921. Because the institution has been of great benefit to hundreds of unfortunates and to permit the institution to be closed or abolished would be a calamity. The Shreveport City Commissioners agreed and the clinic was saved, at least for the moment. This clinic, opened from 1921 to 1925, was also successful, although there are no records of patients found in the Northwest Louisiana archives. Instead, the stories come from the patients themselves. Over the next months, Butler ran his clinic with the support and agreement of the officials of Shreveport. An article in the Shreveport Journal on June 23, 1922, stated that the clinic was where the system can be seen at its best. The reporter first spoke to a young woman from whose eyes the look common to the addict is vanishing and the light of hope dawning. She'd been in the clinic only 20, or excuse me, only 12 days and was already completely off the drug without cravings. Her hope was that not only was the cure permanent, but that she'd be able to go away from the old environment and find a new life. A husband and wife, both suffering from addiction, told the reporter that in previous institutions, they do not keep you and build you up. All they do is make you sick. And when you leave, you're weakened and nervous and a peddler is around the corner to take advantage of your condition. Contrasting that with her experience in Butler's clinic where they were all well fed and well taken care of. Sidney Howard asked Butler for some inkling of his secret of curing addicts. I got nothing, he tells his readers. But one patient addicted for 11 years by his doctor after an accident said, he took me on, then he cured me. When asked how it happened that Butler's, Butler's method worked for him, the man replied, it was surprisingly easy, but I can't tell you why. They did very little except to make me comfortable. Butler didn't call his patients addicts. He also didn't speak of dope, calling it medicine instead. The man continued, Butler picks you up and stands you up. 
I think he has won half his cases before he even begins to take them off the drug. I don't think he has any secret with that. He went on to say that most people wouldn't understand that an outcast wants self-respect very badly. If you give him that, you really exalt him. His last words in the interview were probably the secret Howard was looking for. Butler is civilized about dope. Civilization's a more important affair than most of us recognize. But Butler's successes ultimately didn't matter because the federal government was determined to close the clinic down. And finally, between the constant threat of being framed and jailed and the slow dwindling of patients who needed care, Dr. Butler closed the clinic for good. In a note dated March 13th, 1925, written in the last book of patient records, Dr. Butler stated, these are the last patients still actively being helped and detoxified up until the last 21 were turned over to a private physician to take care of for the balance of the patient's life. All 21 needing an opiate to sustain life and make life bearable until death. I consider each one incurable and entitled to this service. It was a sad time for Butler, who'd seen his work vilified over his years of sacrifice, but he was proud of what he and the men and women who worked for him had done. Butler's clinic succeeded for many reasons, including his attitude toward addicts, his organization, and protection from the state of Louisiana, Caddo Parish, and Shreveport itself, with local officials helping to regulate the patients in the clinic. Butler's compassion and skill by themselves were not enough to make his clinic successful. Tenac tenac excuse me, tenacity, courage, and integrity also played a major role. He never quit fighting for what he believed. Even though the grand experiment only lasted six years, there are lessons to be learned. Dr. Butler proved that many addicts were not criminals. And when handled with honesty, integrity, and just plain good sense, people could recover from their addiction. However, the federal government's encroachment as laws were passed to prohibit drugs also closed down the very support addicts needed. Indeed, as quoted in Traybach's book, Dr. Charles E. Terry wrote to Butler in 1928 telling him, in looking back over the work that has been done here and there through the country, I know of no single piece that can compare with yours as a constructive experiment in the practical handling of cases. The only criticism I would make is that you did this work probably about 20 years ahead of the time when it could be appreciated. Many states are now legalizing marijuana and more will follow. Prison sentences of people who broke the law by using, distributing, or selling drugs are being shortened or excused. Other long illegal drugs may be made readily available as the trend continu continues. Maybe these steps aren't bad in themselves, but the addiction epidemic of the late 1800s, which led to the Shreveport Narcotic Clinic and the courage of Dr. Willis P. Butler still looms over the United States if great care isn't taken. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you. And again, remind you, if you have questions or comments, please post them on the chat board. And now we'll turn to Dr. David Hyland and his discussion of uh, the, the um, making of small town rage. Dr. Hyland. Thank you. The late Larry Kramer noted antagonist and writer in response to the AIDS crisis is known for his bellowing quote, one billion people are going to die from AIDS. As of today, AIDS.gov reports that 36.7 million people worldwide are living with HIV and 35 million have died since 1981. So Mr. Kramer missed by a few million his prediction. Most of the focus in the early years of the pandemic was large metropolitan cities such as New York, Chicago, Houston, San Francisco very little attention was being given to small rural towns, especially the conservative Southern population areas. 
After living in the large metropolitan cities and becoming HIV positive, several gay men returned to Shreveport with the sole purpose of waiting for their own death. They came to be with their families and watch as their lives slipped away, not knowing if they had one day to live, one week, one month, or even a year. It was clear that AIDS had come to an unprepared and bigoted and dogmatic tree fort. The lack of services and downright refusal of many agencies to address the needs of AIDS patients became alarming. And three of these men met at George's Grill and began an effort to establish an organized response to the lack of services. And I'd like to add that of these three men, two were HIV positive. One of them thought he was HIV positive, but ended up not being so. And the reason why is because testing was so sporadic and it was not dependable back in those days. Using public disobedience as their weapon of choice and key negotiating tool, they began to take on government and medical agencies. One of the agencies that was the focus of ACT UP Shreveport's tyranny or uh, protest was LSU Medical Center. Not only had they refused research dollars to try uh, various treatments for the disease, but they also refused to establish a medical clinic to address the needs of AIDS patients. There were even situations that were documented where the nursing staff uh, or members of the nursing staff of LSU refused to feed AIDS patients because they were scared to enter their room. So they would pile trays of food, their meals into the ante rooms before going into the room. Many of the patients were expected to change their own bed linens and they had to uh, get friends to come and retrieve food for them. Uh, and nurses, uh, we found out through our interviews, had refused to respond to the call button. The Deaf Action Center received a $1.4 million grant from the Obama stimulus monies uh, back in 2009, 2010. And a part of that was uh, video uh, production equipment. And so several of us took a documentary class, making class uh, at Bipsy. And we had to um, propose a um, project for the class to work on. And I was going to um, propose a documentary on the organized, the effects of organized religion on Louisiana politics. But I went home and uh, my roommate at the time, she was um, uh, sitting there watching television and we got to talking about this documentary project. And she said, well, you really ought to think about doing something on ACT UP Shreveport because they made significant changes in the way that AIDS patients were um, provided services in this area. So 
to make a long story short, small town rage fighting back in the deep south, which is an independent documentary examines the work and influence of ACT UP Shreveport in the conservative deep south. During the early years of the AIDS pandemic, ACT UP Shreveport sought to bring attention to the plight of those living with the disease and also to bring about change in the way the government and the medical community reacted or in some cases failed to react to the crisis. Taking its cues, though not direction, from other large chapters around the nation, ACT UP Shreveport employed the same attention-grabbing protest tactics that were so successful in cities such as New York and San Francisco. In order to push back the deeply ingrained conservative mindset of Northwest Louisiana, the men of women act up Shreveport staged protests, they crashed meetings, they raised their voices, and they fought to be heard. And as their individual stories are documented in this film, led to changes in the way local hospitals, government agencies, and even the public at large responded to the pandemic. It goes without saying that the future of services being provided to HIV AIDS patients uh, did a tremendous about face from the refusal of many doctors to even see patients. Uh, Chuck Selber, who is, was a member of um, the Selber family, Selber's brothers, um, he was one of the three men that came home to die and uh, he could not see doctors during the day. His mother had to take him to doctors in the evenings uh, when people were not in the offices. Um, as a result of all of the work that ACT UP Shreveport did, uh, the Philadelphia Center was established. Um, in fact, just about every member of ACT UP Shreveport became a staff member of the Philadelphia Center. And of course, that is the area's premier treatment facility uh, and service provider for HIV positive patients. Okay, uh, I assume you have concluded, David? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Then uh, again, I'll remind people to post your comments, questions on the chat board. I'm going to give some of my comments and questions about uh, the three presentations, and then we will go forward with our discussions. Um, uh, first, I want to thank the panelists for interesting and thought-provoking presentations. Some areas of commonality are, are fairly obvious. All three deal with epidemics of a sort. All three focus on the same geographic location, and two of, of the three share a chronological focus. All three presentations contribute to our understanding of Shreveport and Louisiana in the 20th century. I'll preface thurs, thur, uh, further discussion with a bit of context drawn from Adam Fairclaw's Race and Democracy, the struggle for civil rights in Louisiana, 1915 to 1972. Describing the environment within which the civil rights movement functioned, Fair Fairclaw characterized Shreveport as, quote, conservative even by the standards of the South. 
I think that is appropriate in the reaction to much of what we see in, in these three papers. There are indications of this conservative conservatism in these presentations. First, as McLemore indicates, both the local press and public officials in Shreveport were slow to acknowledge the threat posed by the influenza pandemic. This can be considered indicative of a Louisiana tradition. In, the, in her book, The Saffron Scourge, A History of Yellow Fever in Louisiana, 1796 to 1905, Joanne Kerrigan described this threat, this thread as follows. Throughout most of the 19th century, newspapers, not only in New Orleans, but in, also in any town stricken with, the epi with ep epidemic disease, generally adopted a policy of ignoring its presence as long as possible and then minimizing its importance, end of quote. Further evidence of this theme is prevalent in John Barry's Rising Tide as he describes the press and local government coverage of the 1927 flood. I encourage McLemore to compare the Shreveport experience to that found in, other, in journal articles describing contemporary influenza outbreaks in places like Butte, Montana. Corpus Christi in Sherman, Texas, and the state of New Mexico. Not that they were you know, making this front page news every day, but it's not the, the trend we see in Louisiana of ignoring as long as possible. What might prove um, illuminating, um, especially with the um, the medical community's approach to these, uh, or what might prove illuminating in all of them, is how the medical communities approach these epidemics. Nancy K. Bristow's essay quote, uh, entitled, You Can't Do Anything for, in, for Influenza, Doctors, Nurses, and the Power of Gender in the Influenza Pandemic in the United States, makes this observation, quote, Re confronted with the reality that the epidemic was beyond their control, many physicians expressed a new sense of the limitations of their profession. Con conversely, Bristow contends, nurses frequently felt that they had been able to do a great deal of good during the scourge, providing meaningful service to their patients. It would be interested, interesting to learn if similar, if similar commentaries exist within the Shreveport medical communities with, within each of these uh, uh, instances of epidemic. Similar questioning of the medical establishment, especially its physicians and hospital administrators should prove inform, informative regarding the narcotic clinic and act of Shreveport. In both instances, in the early 1920s for the Nar in Shreveport Narcotics Clinic and the establishment of the Philadelphia Center in 1990, both of these examples offered conservative members of the local medical establishment an avenue out of or around a professional conundrum how to avoid the personal and or professional risks associated with, re with treating a reviled element of society while clinging to their ethical obligations to serve society. <clears throat> with a special reference to the Shreveport Narcotic Clinic, uh, as, as Sarah Hamer has explained, the Harrison Act of uh, 1914 triggered the emergence of um, these clinics. This legislation recognized only one legal method to access opiates, a physician's prescription. Moreover, maintenance prescriptions were allowed only for the chronically ill or the elderly. 
maintenance treatment of otherwise ad addicted was not allowed. After this law withstood legal challenges before the Supreme Court in 1919, doctors who prescribed opiates for addicts faced prosecution, further ratcheting up the pressure on physicians. In 1919 and 1924, the American Medical Association adopted resolutions advocating strict enforcement of the Harrison Act. Personally and professionally, doctors increasingly distanced themselves from narcotic maintenance. This evolution in Shreveport would be interesting to research, but extant records, public or private, may not support such an effort. Similar avenues for addiction research abound with regard to ACTA, uh, Shreveport, and the HIV AIDS epidemic in Louisiana. In this instance, however, archivists and oral historians may need to document the issues and their context before historians can plow this ground effectively. Now, um, I think it would be appropriate at this point to give our presenters um, an, uh, an opportunity to respond uh, to my comments, and then we'll get into the into the chat uh, question and comments. I think um, one of the other things that we all have in common is the, the dearth of resources um, to, to study these problems. There are a lot of questions that come up and then, <laughs> then there just is it's so difficult to um, under, uncover information to answer them. The, the fact that we have had COVID and limited access um, to the, lab, the library in Baton Rouge uh, was certainly, um, diff you know, I couldn't explore and they don't have much available that you, that you can access without being there in person. Uh, so I do plan to go to Baton Rouge uh, at the earliest opportunity. Um, I did come across several mentions of Sherman in, in the research I did, and um, since I used to live there, uh, it would be interesting to go back and, and look at that. There are differences. There are many differences. Uh, I lived in Texas for uh, about 25 years. And uh, people used to tell me, in Texas, they used to tell me, oh, it's, it's the same. It's the South. And I said, no, it's really not. Um, so you mentioned Cor Corpus Christi also. So that were, Texas may have become more Southern since I lived there. Um, but yes, I think that would be interesting to do. It's a big project, and I whittle this one down to, to the nubs to get it under the Taylor rule. So, um, I, 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 but I think it's going to be difficult for uh, Sally to find material um, because it just, no one knows what happened to it. My guess is it was destroyed. And, um, because Dr. Butler was very good about giving all of his, he, he gave all of his records that he had in his possession to us at, in the archives. David, um, actually we have started a, an oral history with uh, people at the Philadelphia Center. And I've interviewed at least one of the people who was featured in the film. Um, one of them has died that I know of, uh, probably more, but one I would, uh, Chuck Silver, I would love to have interviewed and never had the opportunity to do so. And I have interviewed uh, one doctor who provided services to those patients and have, have one lined up for probably next week or the week after. So we are attempting uh, by realizing that these um, gaps in in the record exist, uh, we are attempting to get ahead of this one. Um, I'm afraid that the, the early 20th century is 
we might trip over it if we get lucky, but I'm afraid it may be beyond our grasp. The newspapers actually did provide a lot of information. How, how trustworthy they are is another question. And a whole other area of exploration, actually. Indeed. We were very, uh, we were very lucky uh, when we were doing the research for the film that uh, several members of ACT UP had turned over lots of material to the LSUS archive. And uh, it is a trove of documents and photos and videos from back in that day. Um, unfortunately, some people that were very involved in the ACT UP movement did not want to participate in the film. They said that it was just too painful of a uh, experience and that um, they just couldn't bring themselves to dig all that back up. And so um, I'm really glad to hear that you're interviewing uh, people that were involved because you never know just, you know, I know after the film uh, aired and in fact, I think it was, it was seen in uh, Scotland uh, and came back to Shreveport and uh, one of the ACT UP members who did not participate contacted us and wanted to talk and really, to be honest with you, it was more of a therapy session mm -hmm. uh, for him. Mm -hmm. But Yeah, the uh, Philadelphia Center records are uh, maintained at, at Northwest Louisiana Archives, and, and that's ongoing. So uh, that will be documented. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Dr. Butler, uh, who brought his records out there, which go from 1918, Sally, or 1919, 19? Um, to, uh, 1919, of course. Yeah, all the way to what, the 70s, the uh, 90s? 19, 20, 1925 is, is how far the... the but then uh, his, he the was partner. He was also, um, he became a city health uh, officer and he became the coroner and uh, so the coroner's records we have from 1921 on, and those are used quite frequently, actually, for various purposes. Um, and he, he was the coroner from 1921 till... 1916, actually, is when he became 1916 coroner. 1916 to 1972. Something like that. He, and he, then he retired, he and then he came back and served as coroner again until like 1991. He was one of those energizer bunnies that just never seemed to run down. Um, so that is a treasure trove. But unfortunately, we had about four sanitariums here in Shreveport at the time of the, um, well, we had three white ones and two black ones and Charity hospital records are the only one we have any records of. If there are any anywhere else, Shumpert has, I don't know um, exactly how far back their records go, but Shumpert is still, I guess, still has their records. And I don't know about North Louisiana Sanitarium, which became doctors, or um, the records of the two black hospitals. So it's just really thin. And the other clue that I had that maybe there weren't that many records anywhere was that this topic, uh, the, the great influenza of 1918, has not been written about in Louisiana at all. Uh, I, I think I found one article. So uh, that may be because of the dearth of records. And it also may be because it's something that um, we just don't, we, like, we would rather forget, um, and more exciting things, I guess, uh, 
took, took its place in the public mind. I have, okay. I, no, right, I have one, one question. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Sally. I was just gonna add one more thing. I've, uh, it's my, as part of my master's degree, I've been working with the Northwest Louisiana Archives with Dr. McLemore, and I cannot tell you. I mean, if, 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 I, if, if anybody knows what's going on with any of this, it's Laura. And she <laughs> is amazing to be able to find things. So oh, if I know something there, it's because she showed me where to look. <laughs> well, and, and I want to mention that David did not uh, toot his own horn. But that documentary won several awards, um, big awards. So why don't you fill us in, David? Uh, we, uh, we won an award every, everywhere it was submitted. Uh, we won uh, best documentary in uh, the Glasgow Film Festival we won uh, best uh, documentary in the Toronto Film Festival. And then uh, the award that we're just uh, crazy about is we won the humanitarian, uh, the humanities film of the year for Louisiana and uh, that was that was a tremendous honor, uh, and then uh, we also uh, won several international uh, awards for uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, it just <laughs> dropped out of my head, uh, but it's. It's been quite a ride and uh, we were very, very lucky because uh, we did not approach this film in a traditional documentary building way. We went to people and said, uh, we want to interview you and tell your story. Uh, you, you, you can't see it before it's released and you can't uh edit it and uh you just have to uh trust us that we're going to do right by you and and what you did in telling your story we're going to be as accurate as possible and uh that's pretty frightening uh for some and they and they talk about that uh whenever they're interviewed about um, entrusting people that they didn't know to uh, do this. And so it was quite an experience. And I do wanna mention you, uh, Mark Spurlock, who was the local physician that was treating a lot of patients, uh, worked in tandem with ACT UP actually. Uh, ACT UP would go to a particular entity and per, and perform some public uh, disobedience. And uh, a few days later, Dr. Spurlock would go to them and say, you know, you have a choice. You can deal with them or you could deal with me. And he was always a calm, had a calming effect. And uh, they basically act up, got exactly what they wanted through uh, Mark Spurlock's work. So it was quite a partnership. Let me ask you a question that kind of segues into to my, your discussion uh, about the awards comes into this question that I had. What was the reaction in Shreveport to your documentary? Uh, well, uh, every uh, screening was sold out okay. uh, at the Robinson. Uh, the most memorable screening was at LSU. And a, <laughs> a, lo a it lot memorable of Memorable in what way? <laughs> well, a lot of the physicians 
uh, that either were involved at that time or uh, or knew the people that had you know has since passed um, so that story was theirs. I mean, it talked about them, uh, not necessarily by name. And so um, uh, it was well received. Uh, they, you know, uh, they were very complimentary. They felt like uh, they were accurately represented and uh, it was, true what had uh, gone on. Uh, I had one, one other question I wanted to ask you, David. Um, you had made that you mentioned in your, your comments that um, the, the LSU Medical Center had, had refused research dollars. Did they, did they refuse to apply for research grants or did they refuse to take research dollars that were offered? Um, our source for that information is uh, a news clip of an interview that was done with Chuck Selber and he was leading a press conference where ACT UP was announcing that they were going to, um, I think, have a sit-in and they were going to picket uh, the medical center. And he said, LSU has refused research dollars three times. Uh, he didn't say whether that okay. was an application or, or what. They did start doing it, by the way, uh, after after ACT UP got finished with them, they started uh, doing trials. Okay. All right, I'm looking I at the chat. I don't see, I don't see any questions in the chat, so. I think we, we may um, go ahead and wrap this up. I want to thank uh, everyone who was involved in making the presentations and attending the session. And I would encourage um, uh, all of you who uh, have an interest in, in uh, Louisiana history to and want to pursue your research interest to um, Think in terms of uh, putting together sessions for the uh, the 2022 uh, conference. Um, the uh, call for papers is on the uh, LHA website, so um, think about that. And um, if there aren't any other questions for our uh, panelists, I would thank you for your participation. Thank Good you. Good session. Brian. And everybody. Thank you.